the copyright cover licenses and commitment to your music business panel. My name is Tara Catalo, aka Tara C Music, and I am joined by Carlos Eni, aka Woo! Insane in the Rain Music. Hi. And Julia Henderson. Hi. <laughs> All right, so we are going to discuss pretty much everything that you need to know when it comes to getting your covers licensed legally. Uh, as cover musicians, we want to make sure that we do everything that we can to ensure our revenue is secured and risk-free. So let's jump right in. All right, wait. We got, we got, we got to make sure they can see our uh, Yes, I know. Our Give slides. me one second. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm all getting right, there. all right. We're Give a girl there. a minute. <laughs> okay, we're set. Hey. All right, let's let's begin this legal throwdown with <laughs> some common myths and misconceptions relating to legal use. This is chat interactive, so uh, I would like you in chat to answer yes or no to the following questions or the following myths. Is this true or false? Myth number one, or actually thing number one, putting fair use in your video description absolves you of all legal ramifications. This is false i don't know <laughs> i don't know if you thought this would get you anywhere but it will get you absolutely nowhere you can't just tell somebody that the law doesn't apply to you how about this next one uh, as a cover artist you can give permission for others to use your covers however they please without any ramifications in a twitch stream or youtube video this one is also false because well, we'll explain why later but <laughs> it's not true you can't just do that did you know that? No? That's why you're here. Next one. <laughs> Next one. Copyright, co copyright laws do not apply as long as you're not making any money on your content. Is this true? What's that, Dora? False? That's nice job. False. Falso. It's false. <laughs> Regardless if you're making money, copyright law still applies here. I've got another for you. Hear about this one. Oh, this one's spicy for the content creators in the house. Like Revenue from Patreon is just a donation, <laughs> not money in exchange for goods and services. How about this one? It's kind of tricky. Kind of tricky. What do you think? Hmm. This one is tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. Well, I think that our our Twitch viewers are uh, are hip to patterns. So this one is also false. Your revenue from Patreon is taxed just like any other money you get. Um through doing, through, through doing um, business and such. Last one. I can use sounds from video games in my cover or remix and not experience any problems with licensing. Oh, boy. Oh, wait. You mean I can't sample the coin sound or the one-up jingle in my, my hip, my hip chill-step EDM Mario track? False! I can't, you cannot do that without permission. Thank you Thank for joining you, Carlos. me. Thank you for joining me. I was very excited to do this. Thank and you. And now we're going to talk about what you actually can learn from copyright. Yes, exactly. <laughs> copyright. What is it? Why should you care? <laughs> copyright is quite quite literally the right to copy. So, if an author writes a work or a performer makes a recording, no one else has the right to make copies of it without the author or performer's permission. Now, not adhering to said copyright law can result in the least of your worries, which would be a takedown notice, or uh, your biggest fear would be le legal action against you. So, so you got to watch out for that. The Nintendo um, ninjas, as they say. Yes. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple types of music rights. Now, unfortunately, music, when it comes to copyright, is quite a bit more complicated than some other streams of media, perhaps. Uh, so we've got two main streams of commercial music rights. One, which copyrights the work itself. So that can be your composition. That can be your arrangement. That could be the lyrics that you put to it. And then the other side is the phonographic rights. And now this is the recording itself. So this is big to keep in mind, folks, going forward in this panel, that the work, so the writing, is separate than the actual recording of said work. Um, because we are cover artists, we are doing covers, we are doing separate recordings 
of one work. Um, and then underneath those commercial music rights, we have licenses. Um, three main types of licenses when we're talking about music here are your mechanical license, your sync license, and your print license. Now, don't worry if you don't know what those mean right now, because we're going through each and every one of these in great detail, except maybe print license. We'll gloss over that one, but hey, that's cool. The other two we'll cover. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, very yeah. true. All right, so first up, we're going to do mechanical license, okay? So this is the specific license that you need when you want to distribute a recording of a cover that you've made onto digital stores like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Deezer, Tidal, you know, such and such, okay? Now, any commercially, commercially released recording in the U.S. is eligible for what's called compulsory mechanical licensing, okay? And this is per U.S. law. As long as there is a recording, a release uh, in the U.S. of the original track, then it is eligible for this license, okay? And it allows you, as the licensee, to distribute the cover of the song without needing to actually go individually to that copyright holder and discuss those kinds of negotiations and figure out how much you're going to pay them and stuff, um, stuff like that. So um, as long as the arrangement that you've made does not change the basic melody or the fundamental character of the work, right, then it actually falls under this umbrella of this compulsory mechanical licensing, okay? And so if it does change the basic melody or the character of the work, um, then it's kind of considered a derivative work and those are not protected under this, okay? Unless you actually go in, you know, you actually go in and email them or somehow get in touch with the copyright holders and discuss it one-on-one -on -one to get their consent and be able to license it that way. Okay, so examples of derivative works. You've got adding or changing lyrics so that counts as a derivative work. Okay, if you may do a translation, if you do mashup, if you do a parody, those are all considered derivative works, okay? All right, and then the easy way to obtain a mechanical license, because you're probably thinking, okay, well, if I have to do that, how exactly do I do that, right? So what a lot of us do um, is we use some websites to kind of figure out whether a track is licensable. So the one that I think most of us use um, is VGMDB. We check the database and we see if there is an official US release of that track or of the album, okay? And again, if it's released in the US, if there is a price in the USD, then you're good to go. That means that it's licensable, okay? You can also check online stores like Apple Music. That's a pretty good one to check to see if there's a soundtrack or if that track is available. Um, if it is, then that's also that that's good to go because it's in the US um, Apple Store, okay? Um, and using that information, you can distributor. So example, you know, SoundDrop, there's other distributors as well, but I think most of us use SoundDrop now. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and just briefly go through the process together, okay? So give me one second, let me load up the page. Okay, so this is VGMDB, okay? So this is what the website looks like. Say we want to do counterattack from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Okay, let's look. I know the window's a little small, but let's search Xenoblade Chronicles 2. There's a couple over here. There's type A, type B, type C. Type C is the one that we want because if you look over here, Amazon US Digital, iTunes US Digital. That means that anything from this long list of Xenoblade tracks is licensable. And look, Counterattack is right there. Okay, so you're able to use this website to determine whether something's licensable and when you actually upload the cover to SoundDrop, then you can in, uh, input this information so it makes it easier for them to license said cover. So now if you want to capitalize on Pyra and Mithra being in Smash, hey, you can! Hey, yes, you can. <laughs> That, so that's happy. actually a really good strategy because I'm, I'm my so old happy. stuff, where, yeah, like when I'm Sephiroth so made it in, they're like one winged oh, angel. People are like, yeah. Sephiroth's in Smash, come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get so excited. <laughs> yeah, so I may or may not have capitalized on that a little bit today, <laughs> but that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we're going to continue with the mechanical license. Um, 
So let's say that you went through all the steps, you found out it was licensable, you uploaded it to a distributor, you know, and you got that uh, license secured, you've got that cover out on the stores, now you're making some money. Okay, let's try to figure out where does that money go once the cover starts generating, generating revenue, okay? So from, say, the download, right? If you get $1, right? Someone pays a dollar for a, a digital download, 9.1 cents per that composition. So say you only got one license, then that's just the 9.1 cents. For any track that's less than five minutes, basically. So 9.1 cents of that $1 will go to the original copyright holder, okay? If it's longer than five minutes, then you have that 1.75 cents per minute um, rate, okay? And streaming royalties, right? Because this is for digital downloads. Streaming royalties are a little more complicated. Um, I tried to find some information about it and then i gave up because i was like this is way too intense it's so very complicated yeah so we'll just say it's complicated um and then medleys so a lot of people have kind of um warned people against doing medleys because of this 9.1 cents per composition um, because say you have like five different tracks, that means you need five licenses, okay? So that's not just 9.1 cents total, that's 9.1 cents per composition, right? So that actually ends up being almost half of that like $1 download, right? So that's why a lot of people kind of shy away from medleys. You can totally do it, but you have to decide whether or not it's actually... <laughs> A feasible idea <laughs> yeah they're, they're a great way to go as someone in the chat says a good way to go in the negative on each track sold there you go yeah seriously if you want to lose money your... if you want to lose money and promote game music distribute your medleys there your you go upfront <laughs> licensing costs will be it quintupled eats up, as yeah, well it eats so up that, uh, that hooray revenue, so. yeah. don't do it folks yeah. unless yeah. you would you can you don't. can but it's you just can. yeah or, or just separate, like, as, as Thomas is saying in the chat, you can um, separate your medleys into like yes. individual yes, songs. Exactly. You could have it on YouTube as a medley, but then for purposes of sh streaming and, and downloads, you could separate them into, into tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And then if you are using SoundDrop, um, then there is a revenue share. So 15% of your revenue will go to them. And different distributors have different rates and different things, but um, we were supposed to have someone from SoundDrop on the panel. So that's why we kind of decided to do a little bit more um, in depth in terms of SoundDrop stuff. So, but yeah, that is the revenue share for SoundDrop at least, but different distributors have different things. Um, and then the rest of that, so after all that has been taken, um, the rest will go to you and any other artists that you've shared splits with, right? If you collaborate with someone, you do 50-50 split, then okay, then that's going to get split up to you guys equally. So I've got, Tara, just before you go to the next yes. slide, I've got one more thing that I had added that maybe just didn't get like refreshed on oh. that slide. Oh, okay. Um, because 25 to 30% goes to the music store or service. So we can't forget that. Yes. So it's like, okay, money goes, you, you license your cover. Money goes to original right holder. That's that first bullet point. Then you've got 25 to 30% going to your music store, right? So that's the partner. Soundrop would call that the partner. 15% going to Soundrop for admin. And then finally, the rest is for you. So like, it's not like you're getting, you're, you're, when you're doing covers, you're missing out on, a chunk of revenue like and that's just the like how it is for us is. because we have yeah. to split things more so if you if you are really good at originals and can make that work like if you're thinking as a per per track basis you're going to make more money doing originals however they might not be as commercially viable for you so that's the trade-off yes. there we go Thanks. so this this all sounds uh hunky dory so far but like what if i just want to upload everything to Bandcamp and just not do any of this huh like like okay, I can go to I can go to Bandcamp.com, log in, and upload my album. Um, what's stopping me from doing that? Everything, Carlos. Tell us everything. all about it, Carlos. Every, everything. Nothing, <laughs> everything and nothing at the same time. <laughs> well, well, Bandcamp does allow direct uploads of user-generated content, which is different than places like uh, Apple Music and Spotify, where you have to submit through a distributor. Um, I'm not sure if Spotify for artists has like a direct submission thing. I, I think there was some talk about that, but I don't know much about it. Um, but you would think that, oh, well, it's Bandcamp. I can just upload whatever I want because no one's stopping me. Technically, you can, but you could get in trouble. Um, so be because uh, Bandcamp uses user-generated content, um, SoundDrop does not distribute to Bandcamp. 
um, which makes sense, and that's probably how it's going to stay. Um, and because of that, Soundrop cannot secure the mechanical licenses on your behalf for the content it's not distributing, which also makes sense because, you know, it's like what their, what their service does is they keep track of how many times your, your song has been sold or streamed, and then they will, um, they will handle the payments of, those, um, of the proper royalty rate uh, to the original rights holder based on that data that they get. Um, and if they're not getting any data in from a place like Bandcamp, then they can't really do that job. Um, so therefore, you should like the way to do this is you do it yourself. Um, and I've actually done this for my recent album, Cinovation, uh, which is listed on Bandcamp. Um, what my my what me and my team did is we did a big bulk license purchase through Easy Song Licensing before. Um, so essentially, what this looked like was we um, made a list of all the all the compositions that were used, um, all the compositions that were used, um, and. Set a, a, an amount of downloads. I don't remember what the amount was, but it was higher than what we expected the initial sales volume to be. Um, and then pulled, total all that up um, and did stuff for digital, say, um, did the stuff for the CD licenses that were being sold through Bandcamp and the download licenses that were also being sold on Bandcamp um, and put that all up and rounded it, rounded it up into one big number. And it was a very, very, very big number. Um, because you have to like the the proper way to do this is to get everything up front, so every sale is taken care of. Um, this can be financially unfeasible for a lot of artists, and especially if you're doing cover stuff on Bandcamp and you're not working with like capital up, up fronts to get these licenses. Um, and there's a and frankly, there's a lot of stuff on Bandcamp that is not licensed that just kind of sits there and is at risk of being taken down legally. Yes. Um, and you can do the you can get these licenses as I said through bulk purchasing with um, Easy Song Licensing if you want to go the compulsory way, compulsory way, or you can have direct negotiations with the copyright holder. Um, I also did this for my album Live at Grillby's, um, which is music from Undertale composed by Toby Fox. Um, I had an, a wonderfully short email <laughs> exchange with Toby, and was like, "I can I can I cover your songs?" And he was like, "Yes, you have to pay me." And then I said, "Okay, how about this?" And he's like, "Sure, sign this contract." And I said. Okay, here's contract. Let's sign, and that was it. Mm-hmm. We figured out. It, we 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 did a rate. Um, he's actually getting um from the sales of the album, getting a lot more than he would have, um, if it was just a compulsory mechanical licensing rate. Um, so that's that's another strategy, but it's not always um doable, especially if you can't get in direct contact um with with the composer, like for something like from like a AAA company, right. um. And a funny thing, I'm not sure it's funny, um, you might think that, oh, well, what if I just put my stuff on Bandcamp and have it set at name your price, which means that um, someone can download it without paying if they don't want to, and anything that comes in is just extra. The problem with that is that while it might feel like, you know, ethical for you to do that, and like, oh, I'm not making any, like, direct money off of this, the original composer is still losing, or the original rights holder, I should say, is losing out on that potential revenue or that revenue stream um, based on the licenses that should be paid to license that composition. Yeah. Like we said earlier um, of how um, that with, with that myth, myth and misconception of giving stuff away for free means that the law doesn't apply to you. This is not true. Um, so you still have to pay licensing fees, even with name your price on Bandcamp. Yeah. Cause they're still entitled to that, that rate that they get. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. Good. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Next is sync license. All right. Hey. Julia. Hey. Julia, is that <laughs> sync license? Can I make my joke? Can I make my joke? That the sync oh, license is where oh. you sync all your money into? Uh, <laughs> there it is. There it is. See, when I make a joke like that, he takes off his headphones and storms out of the room. And when he makes a joke like that, he like has a fit of laughter at himself. Because so... I know how funny I'm not. Because <laughs> you're the only one laughing. <laughs> okay. I'm only allowed to say this because he knows I love him a lot. So. Okay. Um, sync, sync license allows a person to synchronize a copyrighted piece of audio with visual media. So this is separate than our, from our mechanical, right? So even if you've received your proper mechanical license and your, your stuff is on streaming platforms and uh, your stuff is in iTunes or even you're doing physical CDs and you've got a mechanical license for that, that's awesome. Unfortunately, um, if you want to put your music to 
a movie, commercials, video games, even like website, um, YouTube, haha, <laughs> anything with visual media, this requires a separate license. And unlike mechanical licensing, there is no compulsory equivalent. There's no set rate for composers, the ones that we were talking about before, right? The 9.1 cents stuff. Um, and sync licenses are most often commonly obtained via direct negotiation with the copyright holder. They can be very expensive. They could like, depending on who the copyright, like you're not just going to call up Nintendo and be like, Hey guys, Nintendo, hey, hey, Koji, can hey, I want to make, -san. Ko Koji, Koji -san. <laughs> I want to make a YouTube video. <laughs> um, this, this makes sense though. This is done by design so that the copyright holder has some, uh, has some control over what kind of media their music is put to so that you don't have some like Nazi propaganda film with the mm. ba -ba 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 -ba. wow, wow. <laughs> like <laughs> so that. yeah the, the basically the moral of the story is they're hard to get um and 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 Carlos is going to go a little bit into like what is now happening because of that so, so, so in the modern world okay so let's say let's say that that nazi propaganda video did exist right perhaps it does i don't know uh and perhaps it's been taken down already um it exists where there's some unauthorized use of this content right and i want and i'm the copyright holder let's let's pretend i'm koji kondo hello and let's like, just i want to get rid of it i want i don't want this to exist because it is a bad it is an improper use of my my content and it was not um legally executed for this we have the dmca um the dmca standing for the D digital millennium copyright act um was written into law in the u.s in 1998 um intended to prevent illegal distribution of copyrighted works by allowing copyright holders to request takedowns and i'm sure you've seen a dmca takedown at some point of somebody on youtube using a copyrighted piece of content and then that video is either removed or blocked in certain parts of the world yeah. um, by distributing your covers without the proper license you are at risk of receiving a dmca takedown notice or being dmca i love how it's a verb now like you you you, you don't want to you don't want to get dmca'd by me i mean i don't know exactly how that works <laughs> um and you may have in in i think it was like november of 2020 um there was a lot of activity surrounding the DMCA on Twitch. Yep. And you might think that, oh, that's because the law changed and something's happening then. Um, not really. It ha the, the law hasn't changed, I think, a crazy amount. Um, it's probably changed a, a, a bit in the past, however, 20... Oh, uh, actually, I know how many years it's how been around. How old are you, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's, I, it's, the number of years that the DMCA has been around is the exact same number of years that I have been around. It's actually... I like to think of it as the Digital Millennium Carlos Act. No, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, but uh, different platforms have been enforcing it differently. So we're going to discuss how the DMCA is relevant um, to you. <laughs> Robbie says, ow, my most of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, how the DMCA is relevant to you on YouTube and Twitch, which are the platforms you are probably most familiar with and using it on. I wonder, does TikTok have DMCA's? Probably. Like, but what about all those all those um like if someone were to use gangplank galleon as a sea shanty, can we can we TikTok that? I, I don't I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> the DMCA on YouTube. Um DMCA takedowns can incur copyright strikes on the YouTube channel. Three strikes results in the termination of YouTube channel, which is obviously bad. One important caveat here is that a copyright claim on a video is not the same thing as a copyright strike. Very different. Very um, important to know. Very. This is a very important distinction. In fact, I would argue that copyright claims are a good thing for the most part if they're done correctly. Um, the reason that these are, these are a good thing is because this is basically impl like implied acknowledgement from the original copyright holder they've acknowledged the fact that you're doing something with their material and they've specified how they would like their material to be handled um in an ideal world this is what happens all the time unfortunately um there's a lot of bad claims and fraudulent claims put out there where like somebody has entered their 
cover of something into the the content ID date content ID database, and that makes YouTube think that they're the actual rights holder when they're not. Um, that's a problem that's probably bigger than the scope of this channel. Um, but in an ideal world, like all of our um, like claimers would be like the original rights holder. Like if I cover a song from Persona Five, I should be expecting a claim from Atlas on that video saying, "Okay, you've acknowledged the fact that you're covering Last Surprise." from persona 5 this is okay your video may maybe may remains to be watchable worldwide mm -hmm. um and they can specify the policy of we want a revenue share or we want all the money that's generated from this video and it should be up to them to make that decision i mean obviously a revenue share would be preferable for for us um if because we want to make some money off of it right. um as long as it's legitimately atlas and not some random person who put their stuff in content id so <laughs> stupid mm -hmm. um with copyright um, strikes, however, the original copyright holder has to initiate a takedown request. So, like, this is mostly mostly manual, I think, um, but it's a bigger deal than a claim because claims are generally like um, automatically done with content ID. But these copyright strikes are like removals of videos for using content in a bad way. Um, these also the DMC also applies on Twitch. Um, it's a little bit more recent this development. Um, the DMC on Twitch can result in a takedown or muting of one of your VODs. Um, and having this done too many times on your account can result in an account ban. I think there's probably more negative repercussions on Twitch I'm just, I'm just not familiar of. Um, but there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot of so stuff. So someone clarified uh, in the chat that um, the strikes and takedowns are always manual. Oh, uh, okay. Impossible. Okay. Got it. Got oh, it. That Christine, makes sense. Yes. Okay. It should be, it should be manual. Yeah, it really should. Um, like if it, yeah, I'd be a little worried if it wasn't manual. Yeah, so. you just autom automatic strikes on your channel. Yikes! Oof. That sounds that sounds not Gross. fun. Yeah. Ugh. All right, nice. Claims are a good thing. All right, last type of license. We're gonna go through this really quickly because I want to make sure that we have some time for questions at the end. Um, so. This um, is a license if you ever want to distribute your arrangements um, of like a copyrighted composition and you want to actually have sheet music available for sale. Um, again, there's no compulsory equivalent here. Um, unfortunately, the mechanical licensing is, is pretty, it's pretty nice to have. It's pretty easy to get. Um, but the print licensing, it's, it's kind of like sync licensing. It's, it's not very easy to, to get. So, um, However, there are some sheet music distributors that have contracts with some companies already in place so that they're able to get the print licenses rather easily for you and you're able to distribute your sheet music um, arrangements and just have them for sale. And so they're able to figure out, okay, that much money goes to this company and then the rest goes to you, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's two websites that we were able to think of. There's Sheet Music Plus and then Music Notes. I believe Music Notes has been around much longer and they definitely have um, secured contracts with a lot of different companies over the years so they're probably like the the best one to go to but sheet music plus also has that um that option for you so all right next we have a case study and julia is going to kind of go over what happens if you use sampled content without a license <laughs> okay let me tell you a tale <laughs> <laughs> um may 19th 2019 Oops. minecraft youtuber <laughs> mumbo jumbo i'm gonna lean in real close mumbo jumbo received over 400 consecutive claims not strikes right we, we remember the difference on his videos from warner chapel music he like it was within a, the span of a few hours like just bang in his inbox, like one after the other. Um, the claims were from his intro song called Can't Stop Me, which was by a producer he had, I guess, contracted to, to make uh, make this intro song. Pro-leader, pro pro-lead pro, pro R. Man, I don't know. Let's go pro-leader. Pro hey, pro-leader. Cool. Yeah. So these guys had a written agreement uh, between each other. To, to be able to use the song mumbo jumbo was under the assumption that this song was 100 percent uh original material um but 
unbeknownst to mumbo jumbo, uh, pro leader had sampled Gene Chandler's 1967 song, Nothing Can Stop Me, owned by Warner Chapel. And neither party had received sample clearance for use in media. Folks, what kind of license is that? Sample clearance for use in... They would have needed the sync license, but more specifically, they would have needed the sync license like to use a sampled bit of material, which is like even even trickier. Um, moral of the story, a couple things we can take away from this. We can agree, poor mumbo jumbo, because, you know, unfortunately, he did not do his due diligence and make sure that his producer was not using any sampled material. And even though the producer, you could say the producer's at fault here, he should have known better. Yeah. Well, like, unfortunately, if you're the one using it for your content, even if you have contracted someone else to make it for you, it is your burden to have to make sure that whoever's making your content is not like borrowing any material. And so I don't just mean sampled material, but also like um, I made this comparison before, like if they want to take like Secret of the Forest and like quote a giant chunk of it in their like original song, that's also a no-no. And if someone, if he didn't know like this is Secret of the Forest, but then all of a sudden um, like Mitsuda is claiming like, oh, actually this is Secret of the Forest, like, yeah, you got to make sure. And so, you know, maybe work with people who you who are also familiar enough with the law that they're not going to end up putting this kind of stuff in there um, by accident. Luckily, though, luckily for Mumbo Jumbo, A, these were not takedown requests. These were simply claims. So like it meant he lost monetization. Um but he was able to cut out the intro. Like if this had been stuff it smack dab in the middle of his video, he would have had to mute segments of his video. He would have had to replace the audio. It would have been probably not great, but like he was able to cut out the intro um, and then submit the counterclaims and say, okay, it's good now. We're like, it's, we, we've removed all the infringing material. Um, this also contrary to popular belief is not an example of content ID misuse. This Warner Chapel was completely in their right to uh, to claim these videos. In fact, they would have been in their right to issue takedowns if they really wanted to. And this was actually probably the like least horrible thing they could have done. So this isn't an example of like, YouTube is bad. Ban YouTube as a platform. YouTube is bad maybe for lots of other reasons. But this is like, things like this are probably a poor example of why YouTube is bad. Um, there we go. That's my spiel. Very Thank good. You. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about how to make money legally using copyright, right? Because you don't want any of those things to really happen to you, right? Um, I want to make sure that you do things as legally as possible and there's no risk involved in terms of the revenue that you get for your covers. So first thing, distribute your music, guys. Just do it, okay? But you're, you're really not losing too much and you never know if something might blow up and get you know thousands hundreds of thousands or something of streams on spotify like you just you don't know so the sooner you're able to distribute your music the better um you earn the money right you get that revenue but then the original composer also gets their share that's you know part of that whole u.s law so um, and also making your music available only via dir like direct digital download instead, like instead of doing that and streaming, that's only going to inhibit your earning potential, right? Um, we've had a little bit of a talk before. There's a lot of people on Twitter who like to talk about how they make so much more money on, you know, um, like per, per download on Bandcamp versus how much money they make per stream on Spotify. That's comparing apples and oranges, guys. You cannot do that because a download, they can pay the $1 and listen to it as many times as they want. What if they listen to that 2,000 times and that would be you know 2,000 streams and what if that actually ends up being more than the one dollar you would have gotten for that download you don't know right so you cannot compare the two there are two very different things and so make sure that you also think about having your covers available for streaming because that's just another way to get money and then um the whole copyright thing in terms of like pro 
um, performing rights organizations. So this is more for like original music, right? When you actually write music yourself, um, then you need to be a part of a performing rights organization. I've listed a couple from the US and then SOCAN is um, Canada, but there it differs per country. Each country has their own performing rights organization that you can you know, be a part of. But they are the ones that ensure that if someone else performs your composition, that's where the performing rights organization comes from, is if someone else performs your composition, you are entitled to royalties. And so that's another way to get um, some extra money in your pocket in terms of you know, when you make actual um, original music. Um, so we've got that. And then this one, we have sound recording digital performance royalties. So this is sound exchange, resound from Canada. There's probably a couple others um, in different countries. Sound exchange is um, the one in the US. So this, again, we talked about how they have two different types of um, rights, right? We have the composition right, and then we have the actual audio recording right. Um, and so this is for the audio recording. So even if you make a cover, yes, you don't own the composition rights, right? You don't own that, but you do own your own recording. And that is also entitled to some royalties when it comes to being streamed on like radio, like digital radio or regular radio, Pandora, um, things like that. You get some money from that. It's not a ton, but literally, it's still something. Literally pennies. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's still <laughs> something, guys. <laughs> Everything is just literally pennies. <laughs> yeah. Gotta start somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, so you have, uh, different royalty pools, depending on if you're a creator or if you're a performer, if you're a creator as well, then you're entitled to more ro royalties, right? That makes sense. Um, and then another thing for originals, um, just a really quick one, just to throw out there. Um, if you have your own original and you want to license it out to other people to use in their media, right? So you're on the other end of this, in a sense. Um, you can upload your music to production music libraries. They're able to, you know, ha put your music out there. People are able to check and say, I want to use that for my movie. I want to use that for my TV show. I want to use that for YouTube. And mm -hmm. then you make an agreement and then they pay you the license, you know, they pay you for that so that they can use it in their media. Um, so it's kind of on the other end of um, this whole copyright thing. Could we explain PRO just a little bit more? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Just, just, <laughs> just because of um, explaining how they're relevant to this particular yes. community. Like, if you're a cover artist, you don't. It's not like you put your cover song with a PRO. That's not mm -hmm. how it works. Um, I think Julia might be able to speak to this better than me. The performing rights organizations speak to the specific, like the work itself. Remember at the beginning we spoke about the different streams of copywriting music and we have the phonographic rights but then we also have the rights having to do with the work itself so that's what pros cover they cover performances of your written work and this is not arrangements this is original material um so if uh at a venue that is known known for performances if they perform your material a cover band let's say or they blast it like if they're playing it on the radio any public performance of your work this is where they technically pay into let's say bmi or ascap or they pay into so can they pay into this royalty pool and then you once it's uh noted that they played your song or you know that someone is going to be playing your music like like a choir is going to be playing your music, you can then report that to the performance rights organization and get your cut of the, the royalty there. So that's what this is for exclusively. It's not for any recording. So it doesn't matter if you like have a recording and someone used your song in a video game. Like that's not what this is for. Um, it's it's for performance. Uh, hopefully that clarifies. It's, yeah. it's a little confusing because there's so right. many streams here. One of the interesting things is that, you know, could you consider Twitch a venue? Like that's one of the the new innovations oh, of, of like live streaming things is like well how does how does Twitch right. get a license for a cover that's, song and I've wondered the same thing too like right. so if you're if you're a popular okay let's say Ninja is playing uh, playing some video game music in the background like not as part of the game but as he's doing something else and is that not radio is that not a public performance like what how, where are we drawing the line and this is something that dmca and in canada the the canadian broadcasting act because it was what like 1995 like these don't account for these things because they could not have foreseen way back then that 
there were going to be such thing as streaming platforms or all of these user generated content platforms, like how would they have accounted for this? So really, like if we're blaming things, it's not the platforms. We're blaming that the law is so far behind that they're not accounting for these things. And the platforms are trying to wiggle their way through this and figure out how can we exist within the law yeah. and not make every our users angry, yeah. but also all the people that can like actually sue us and like record labels that have millions of dollars to put into lawyers. Like how can we not make them angry as well? Yeah. As soon as there's a lawsuit God. to set a precedent for this kind of stuff, we're all boned. So this is what we're trying to avoid here. Right, and we've right, got to do right. our parts to, to try to avoid that as well. Yeah. I believe that if you're if you're performing a cover song at a venue, right, and that is the venue's responsibility to be yes, the one to, to pay the royalty, right? Or to, yeah, they to pay they pay a general fee to the performing rights organization, so they don't pay it like per play. It's like uh, they pay their due deal, like their their they they owe fees, and they should be paying. If they're not, then they sh they should not be playing other people's music. Like that's right. I was thinking of how, how that, that would works. how that specifically works in the context of. <clears throat> um, playing video game music at video game conventions. Um. Yeah, <laughs> it's complicated. I don't. Well, think right, really because then you're it. like, okay, well, does the gay lord ha are they paying the PROs, right? So then you're wondering, like, <laughs> is the gay lord paying the PROs? Like, can't like so. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Man, so I, this I, this segues I, into it. This segues into a question, which maybe we'll just cover right now, because okay. someone asks, "What's sure. the legal What's the legal ramifications for writing arrangements for a school band and performing those arrangements?" That's Blitz Spencer, um, asking that. Well, really, like probably, wait, I'm seeing realistically, like probably none, like not a lot of like, if if you're if you're doing it at a school. And you're writing like a video game music arrangement and you're performing it at your school. Like, I don't think that this is like, uh oh, we're in trouble. You're like, if you were to do everything the proper way, it would be like, okay, we get print licenses to be able to do the arrangement of all the things. And then we can disseminate that or like distribute that to the band members. And then we pay the PRO so that they can, the, the composers can get their cut. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think this ever happens, right? And these it, things, like lots well, of things slip through cracks and. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so. I, I don't think, I don't think, I wouldn't say never, but I would say like, it, in it, a with, school like, context, I haven't there there hasn't been like a big legal battle. I feel like schools probably are somewhat protected because it's an educational institute, you know what I mean? So you could I'm, make that or I would say that that could be a legal defense if someone mm -hmm. were to be like, you did not then you could say, well, this is for educational purposes and that would be your legal defense. <laughs> yeah. Possibly, right? Yeah. Like I don't know like but there there I don't think there's a precedent for this kind of stuff no yeah, yeah I don't... usually it does fall under fair use wonkers is what he's saying but like fair use because it's the defense right like you yeah, can't just you'd have to be brought to court in order to use that as a defense you can't just yeah so but yeah, they I... they would be unlikely to sue you because they know that that could be used as a yes. defense yeah. if that makes sense so keyword is key, keyword is unlikely like it's not impossible it's not it nothing nothing here is impossible we all could have our channels like deleted tomorrow okay that's within the realm of possibility yeah. here what it's we're true. doing is is like we're skirting the law in in the most finite of senses okay we'll let carlos could do that final slide and then try to answer some more questions oh here. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds yeah. Good. Let, let's let's just so we, we have a lot of questions and we would love to discuss them um yes but there's um just like general good practices that I think are um, helpful to remember. Do you guys want to like, do you want to do one of these each or should I just, I can just go through all of them if you want. If you want to go through all of them, you can. I, I really sure, sure. Okay. Um, so these are like, um, we've been talking about this kind of how, um, like we've been telling you the law, right? And it is you and, and, you know, lawyers interpret the law and that's what courts do is they interpret the law to see how, you know, what, 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 how the law applies to certain, certain situations. You can also do that yourself to some extent and like, and, and decide where the level, decide where the proper level of risk is for you. Like, you know, there are plenty of unlicensed cover albums on Bandcamp that are currently up and are currently generating revenue for the person who put them up there and not the original composer. Is it against the law? Yeah. Is anything happening against it? Probably not. Could something happen against it? Yes. Right. And, and it's up to you to decide, like, with your specific situation, like, are you going to do the, the, the like everything legally right? Or are you just going to do what you can? You know, 
Um, and this is up. I'm not going to get on my soapbox and explain, but this is up for it shouldn't be up for you to decide, but it currently is <laughs> up for you to decide. Yeah. Um, another one is just um, reading your contracts carefully. Um, this more applies to like a work that you would accept as a um, like as, as a commissioned artist, like if you're recording a song for a game or composing something or doing something for somebody else. Um, it, it you always know what you're getting into have someone that knows what like what 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 laws are <laughs> or how to interpret all the legal ease um because you might not know if you're signing up for something really bad that that will that, that could potentially significantly limit you in the future like julia had a bit of a story about this if you do want to share it uh sorry story about the contract one. Oh yeah um i'll, I'll share briefly uh sure. i had a i had a contract um, where someone wanted to commission a, a song for a pilot episode of something that was basically for a school project, but they had wanted to expand upon this later and make it like a real thing. And their kind of grand dream was to make this a real, a real show and have it airing and everything. But for the small fee, they were offering me to make this intro song, basically the theme song they wanted to have perpetual sync rights for everything that they may create in the future having to do with the franchise. So I immediately, like, this is red flags. So now, now that we understand where, where the rights are, we can negotiate a little bit, hopefully as musicians, and just think, okay, well, first of all, by taking only the upfront fee, I'm giving up any sort of royalty splits. Um, I'm giving up the ability to charge for multiple licenses for each different, um, like for if they were to make a video game, if they were to make a web comic, if they were to make different different areas, I'm losing the ability to charge separately for that. Um, and in speaking with entertainment lawyers, what they'll do is they'll tell you to add something like an option. So an option would be like, okay, if you were to do X, you will also pay me Y. So I will give you permission to use this for this. If you also do this, then you have to give me this, basically. Or if this generates more than X amount of revenue by da 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 da, then you have to pay me blah 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 split. You you can include things like this. So it, it's important to understand where your rights are as a musician, so that you don't get screwed over by uh, by those by those contracts. Because because usually the people writing the contracts, I'm going to say, don't really fully understand your rights. So you need to know your rights. Right. Got to right. advocate mm. for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And know your rights. Um, one last small thing. I mean, it's a small or big thing um, is consider incorporating your music business. Um, one, if you're in the U.S., um, you can form something called an LLC, which is a limited, a limited liability company or corporation. I'm not sure. Um, we, I mentioned it specifically here. I mean, it's, it's generally good practice. If you have a business, then keep your business income separate from personal income. Um, but it's also good because it separates the assets, like your assets that belong to the business versus like your own personal stuff. Um, for example, if a company were to sue you for some, some infringement you were doing, um, if you did not have an LLC, if you were, were not under the protection of a um, specified legal like section like section of your company, then all your like all the assets that you own personally are that could be targeted or by seized, this yeah. company um, or seized, yeah. But if you have an LLC, stuff that is owned by the company, which is, I mean, if you're a sole proprietor, then where does the company start and where does the individual person end? That's different. Um, and the type, and as, as Mason is saying here, um, the type, there are, there are different types of business um, and, and formal incorporation might not be right for you yet, um, but there are different t uh, tax classifications or types of business you can incorporate as yeah. um, have their own advantages and disadvantages. Not going to get into that here. That's a big, big topic. Um, so is it time for questions? It's time for hey questions. Uh, I'd like to okay, start off. Okay, we got some. I, 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 do you guys have the spreadsheet open? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hold, hold on. I'm going to switch back to our this one. And then so I can have my screen back. Oh. Yay. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. now. Uh, I want. I want. Uh, can 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 we just clarify? Maybe maybe we'll skip over ones that are more like personal that you could maybe uh, ask Soundrop about, like like send a message sure. support. Like, yeah, like, yeah. More yeah. Of a Let's just kind thing. of look more into the more general stuff. 
I was saying we like highlight the stuff that's worth discussing between the three of us on stream. Mm -hmm. okay. Like, um, well, you can only highlight, so you go for it, Carlos. Oh, okay. This this funny one. Um, there's one from Sebastian Wolf that asks, um, <laughs> what li what licenses do I need to sell my covers as NFTs? <laughs> I just learned what an NFT was like two days ago. So, uh, if that shows you how far the law is behind Oof. music distribution, then uh, you're witnessing the birth of a new art form or a new distribution form here. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Sebastian, tell, tell me when you find out. I'd love to know. <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to know. Um, let's see. How about this one from um, Tarot Tale, who asks... Um, how are certain cover slash remix producers able to offer some of their work as streamer friendly when they are not the original rights holder? They can't. They yeah, can't. They're they can. lying to you. They're, they're either lying. they're either like I, I think like this again. This is like Sebastian. What he's said before. They are either like deliberately misleading you, or they are just like so unaware. But they can't. Right. Like legally, yeah. yeah they they don't. They have can the rights. they can tell you with their originals. Yes. Yes. yes and and like even you might extend that to like that particular recording of that particular original not right. if someone else makes a cover but anyway yeah right. so you can't how are they able to they're they're misleading you so i i feel poorly for people who are like oh well my favorite creator says i can use their covers and remixes they're such a good person but <laughs> unfortunately they're not such a good person because they can't grant you that right and it's it sucks because we don't then want okay all of us all of us creators out there i hate that word but whatever creator we gotta we gotta make sure we don't tell people that they can do this because then if someone gets in trouble for using basically someone else's content that you gave them permission to use, then they're gonna, but so-and-so told me it's okay and they were lied to me and they're gonna get so upset and then they're gonna, you know, like the cover community is gonna have a bad reputation. Don't do it's that. It's just bad. It's bad because just because a cover artist says it's okay to use it does not give you legal clearance. So just just be aware of that. The fact that you're at this panel, you're learning this now, it's good because the more people who are aware, the more people who know this stuff, then the better off we will be because we'll have less of these issues happening, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Right, right. Mm -hmm. Um another one from um from Tig's voice, Tia in the chat. Um, how much against the rules is it to do a cover on stream that you don't have the rights to? Is that in, I'm assuming that means on Twitch. Is that enforced or something that isn't usually judged? Um, I have I have the Twitch music guidelines page up, which is actually really horribly depressing to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, it says, um, here are some examples of music content you may not use in Twitch streams or on-demand content. Uh, cover song performance. Performance of a song owned by someone else, comma, with the exception of a live performance in your Twitch stream. It's like, like this is going back to what you were talking about earlier with like the like Twitch being a like a like a venue, you know, and having a PRO associated with Twitch. Right. Like, there's not really anything associated with that. Um, good news is what they're, what they're saying is that like, um, uh, they say if you do perform a cover song in a live Twitch stream. Please make a good faith effort to perform the song as written by the songwriter, um, which is basically like um, that's you the could, derivative yeah, thing we were going back to. They are yeah. Yeah, they are saying you can do a live performance. They they say that here you can do a live performance of until a song the PROs start else. to get angry at Twitch yeah, and yeah, then decide that then. that's public performance and that they need to start. Until that happens, you're safe performing it basically, but you're not safe just like playing it in the background. Does that make sense? Right, right. Like over over your game or like playing it while you're cooking. Like, yeah, has to be active active performance. I'm guessing that's what this means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you should like, yeah, I mean, active performance of a song you don't own the rights to is okay. And like they mentioned stuff about not sampling the original song, which is, hmm. I guess, par for the course in terms of like licensing and stuff. They're probably just trying well, to Well, like if you're taking a, a karaoke where someone just like faded down the, they did the face cancellation on the vocal, like yeah. but the back track is essentially the same. Like beware of that, perhaps. Yeah. That could yeah. be a flag. Yeah. Um, here's another one from uh, Nick the Newbie. How much does a YouTube cover artist need to worry about channel strikes if they have no plans to monetize their videos? So... I the same because, as if you plan to monetize. Yeah, it's the exact, it doesn't matter. It's, no it's the exact same. It does not matter, it unfortunately. It doesn't matter if you monetize it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, the... 
yeah, it, it's just the fact that you're monetizing or not. Um, in general, how much do you need to worry about a, a channel strike? It depends what you're uploading. Yeah. Obviously, like, and I think, uh, I think what we've said before should give you an, like an idea of like what licenses you should be getting, and if you're using other people's copyrighted material, and like, how can you get it? How can you get it? Are you gonna do, go ahead without it? Who knows? <laughs> okay. Um, um, Feather Derg asks, how do you monetize covers of VGM on YouTube? Do you just wait for a claim and hope that the copyright holder happens to, to decide a revenue split instead of taking all the video's revenue? Or is there anything you can do beforehand to increase the odds of getting a split? So is, this, my, is this asking uh, first? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, uh, I think they're, they're asking, um, how does ad revenue work? on YouTube. How do you how do you monetize a thing on YouTube? Cuz that's like that's the first step is you need to become the YouTube partner so that yeah. you can even get the monetization. And that's kind of a big step. Well, you actually I mean, you can have a video claimed because YouTube will run your ad YouTube runs ads on pretty much all videos, right. I think. Regardless if you're partnered or not. You can and I I I don't know where the money goes if an ad is running on your video and you're not partnered. I don't know exactly how that works. Um but to YouTube, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's but but, I get. <laughs> but a claim can certainly happen on a video that is uploaded yeah. by someone who's not partnered, right? That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's anything that you can do from the creator side because that wouldn't make sense. It should be it's the onus of the original rights holder to ensure that their stuff is in content ID. We, That's yeah. The only thing that I can think of is if you talk to your friends and maybe have a database of uh, rights holders who are more likely to do a split versus than a flat out claim and then just kind of like know like, oh, At Atlas is good with splits. So if you cover Persona, then you're... Yeah. you should be okay like that's the only way that i can like really think about it but do you want to limit yourself that way creatively you know th with this law stuff that's another big question is like it's the ethics it's the law and it's like how much do i feel copyright is limiting me creatively do i feel like personally i'm gonna yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah. yeah anyway it's 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 complicated um yeah I, the way i approach this is that like i mean full disclosure my videos on youtube are monetized i don't know if that's like perfectly legal but i do have some videos of a very small minority that are claimed by the original rights holder like atlas included and mm -hmm. they have specified a policy i don't remember what exactly it is but ideally you'd have a claim on every video which would be that like every every yeah. composer has put their song into the database and they have decided how the money is supposed to be handled and you and don't I, rely on ad, ad revenue like yeah. or or yeah YouTube. yeah or just don't like, yeah and that that's that's the truth um just don't rely <laughs> yeah. on that and just keep your stuff licensed <laughs> Right. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, that's basically it. Um, we probably have time for one or two more. Mm -hmm. Um, I uh, mean, I kind of quickly want to address fun, fun bill. Um, yeah, sure. The VGM DB. So the other one, if you can't find um like a a soundtrack on VGM DB, uh, you can go to Easy Song Licensing. There's a search database. Um, you can go in there, type in whatever the track name is. See if it loads up. At least this is this is through SoundDrop, okay? Like SoundDrop says if anything loads up in Easy Song licensing that you search for, then it's licensable through SoundDrop. So like Battle of the Windfish, right? That one um, is actually licensable because it's actually somehow available through Easy Song licensing. It's it's really complex, but basically SoundDrop says if it loads through Easy Song licensing, then they are able to actually license it. So that's the other website that mm -hmm. I would go to just to check and see if if it shows up there. There okay, I because I'm not seeing oh. There was one thing that I saw discussed with the, the like n people not liking, not appreciating the SoundDrop split right mm. versus the, the distro kid up front mm. now okay this is a personal choice for you guys just so yes. you know distro kid charges money up front and you pay them to keep your music up on platforms continuously and now if your if your songs are getting a whole bunch of streams and downloads continuously then maybe that's worth it for you. But it ought to be said that if you guys see a cover that you think ought not to be licensable up on SoundDrop or sorry, on Spotify or, or any digital store, it's probably because it was licensed through DistroKid who does not do the proper due diligence necessarily of securing that license before it goes live. And then the onus is on you if you have not double checked that it's licensable 
uh, you might be liable to these takedowns. And this has happened to people that we know where like an entire country, they they can't see any of the stuff anymore because DistroKid just decides like, oh, Canada? Nope. Doesn't exist. I think it was like Jonathan <laughs> Young or like Rich, Rashad, like Canada. Oh, your stuff doesn't exist in Canada anymore. Bye bye. So <laughs> uh, we don't know. Like there's 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 some processes beso- behind the scenes. And if David were here, he'd, he'd let us know. But oh, yeah. like the not we- all not all distribution platforms are created equal and you got to watch out for that. So you got to make that decision and do your research, guys. Yeah. And we can yeah. talk about it more in like the the discord as well um, about like the the, the whole differences between like Sounddrop and DistroKid. If you want yeah. us to lay it out, we can definitely do that. Um, we'll do that. We'll share the slides. Yes, we'll, we will do we'll all sound of that. off. We're not lawyers, but we like it. We like this stuff. Yeah. So I think that's it, right? I think we're oh, just right on time. I think we could all talk about this for a lot longer. Oh, we definitely we, we, could. We could. We but, could. Uh, but all right, so we'll we'll wrap it up here. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys learned. We hope you guys learned learning. a lot. <laughs> um, we wanted to thank VGM together for letting like us just be like host this panel, be on this panel, just get this information out there for you guys. Um, we will be answering more questions in the Discord. So if you have more questions, feel free to join their Discord and ask us there, and we will tr- do our best panels discussion. Yeah, we will do our best to answer any questions that come and, up and, there. And- Sarah, are you performing today? Oh, yes, I am performing. What time? Uh, 4.15 p.m. PST, so 7.15 p.m. EST. Well, I know what I'm doing at 4.15 p.m. <laughs> PST today. I also know what I'm doing at 6.20 p.m. PST today. Oh, what is that? The, 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 Mar- the, the Paper Mario thing. Oh. Is that today? Yeah. Yes, is that that's 6.20? Tonight. That's. I think that's, yep, I think that is. So. Okay, and then Julia has a thing tomorrow, right? You have another uh, panel tomorrow. Nice. Awesome. Awesome, so you will see all of us. Um, throughout the weekend Um, and thank you again and please keep watching VGM together. Bye! Bye. Go get serious!